We'll see. Maybe we'll pass the mic around. Maybe there's a question. But uh, today, the final installment on this is part 16 of the sermon series, As the World Turns. I want to apologize to you. I want to start off this morning apologizing uh, to you if you have felt that this series was going to be the silver bullet. Um, if you felt that this series was going to be one of such that if you grab and grasp the principles of it, that your entire life, all of life's problems, your entire life would receive a renovation, that everything that you were dealing with would go away, health issues, financial struggle, family issues, marital, that it was all, I, I want to apologize if this series has caused you uh, to feel or to think uh, to think that way. In Christianity, we have been sold bills of good. And there is typically the sale that happens um, outside of the small print. In other words, it's never written in the small print, but we never take chance or take opportunity to read the rest of what's written. And so we buy the wonder drug, we buy the miracle cream, we, we buy the oil, whatever it might be, and we use it uh, we do what the preacher says. And if we get any movement, when we get some movement, we cannot ignore that we do get some movement, but, but it typically doesn't look exactly like what it used to be or what it was or what we even thought it was going to be. Um, a thought just ran across my mind and even came out of my mouth before I completely processed my first thought. I uh, grew up in the church where they would say, I looked at my hands and my hands look, look down at my feet, and my feet did too. <clears throat> there is this understanding. Um, you, you, you have to keep walking to one day look in the mirror and realize that you've lost weight. <laughs> uh, you know, that's why I'm trying to say, don't get on the gym. Don't get on the scale every day. Just put in the work. Weigh, weigh yourself once a week. Weigh yourself once a month. Just, just put the work in because sometimes you don't even see the change. <clears throat> And this has just been one of those exercises, one of those events, uh, an opportunity. This has been some theology. This has been a lesson, a presentation, whatever you want to call it, that you should grab, that you should take, and that you should tuck away in your heart near and dear, that the way you change your world is by changing your mouth, but it does not necessarily mean today what you speak that it shows up this afternoon before the game comes on. This, is, this has not been... This has not been a silver bullet. Uh, theologies uh, come out of movements. Theologies come out of movements. Uh, there's this, the word of faith movement. Uh, great principles, great teaching on faith, um, but, but it's, it's not all about faith. Has anybody ever believed God for something that you knew was in his word? You found the biblical principle. You found the scriptures. You spent time studying. You knew that God wanted to do this. And you threw your whole weight on it. And it didn't get done. Am I the only somebody like, like that had something that was near and dear and it, and it didn't happen? Man, so, so, so it can't be that I don't have enough faith. How about the gifts? For a while I was taught that the gifts were inoperable. I grew up in a conservative Baptist setting. I went to an evangelical seminary, though that's becoming a bad word these days, but built on the principles of the virgin birth, the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, sin, hell is a real place, heaven is a real I grew up understanding theologically speaking and having some of the world's greatest scholars explain build, convincing biblical argument that the gifts of the Holy Spirit had ceased, that they were merely for the birth of the church. That there's no reason for tongues, no more reason for healing, no more reasons for discernment, word of knowledge, prophecy. None of the gifts were, were needed anymore. And so from that, this whole nother division came um, that was this evangelical movement that was without the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, sound exegetical teaching, sound, sound, sound biblical teaching. That's what that word exege exegetical simply means. It means that when you are line upon line, precept upon precept, don't just get up and ramble. Oh, if you want to get on my nerves, just get up and ramble. I'll give you a pass if I like you, but don't, 
Don't take a text and not come back to it. It's, uh, the Bible got too much to say for you to keep talking. Yeah. So, so, so from, from that kind of movement, from that kind of movement, um, there was this, this, this snuffing out, this choking of the Holy Spirit to have room to do. What he, are y'all understanding what I'm saying? So it depends on what kind of movement that you were familiar with or that you were interested in. Um, it, none of it was ever a silver bullet, which is why I encourage people to drink from multiple streams, which is why I try to balance my preaching. I'm not just a faith preacher. I'm not just a deliverance preacher. I'm not just a healing preacher. I, I, I want us to, to balance our beliefs. I want us to embrace all of what Scripture has. And so now we're back to where I started. I apologize. If anyone um, bought a bill of goods or believed that this sermon series, long as it has been, this being the 16th installment, was going to be your silver bullet. Today, my job is simple. My job is simple. <clears throat> my job is simple. I want to balance your theological understanding. I want to add some counterweight to what we've been speaking. Now, at the root of this whole series, uh, as the world turns, my words shape my world, it has been using our mouths to shape our world. It's been speaking to things, making declarations and making decrees and well, what's going on on the inside of our heart and understanding in James chapter 1 that the tongue is like a rudder. It controls a big ship or the tongue is like a bit in a horse's mouth. This little bitty thing, 2.75 ounces of flesh, doesn't even have a bone but can do so much damage that there's power in our dentures. <laughs> there's power in our mouths. Uh, that's a sermon title by one of my preaching heroes, Dr. Tony Evans. Uh, there's dynamite in your dentures. Um, that, that here is this, here's, this, here's this power that we have innate in our mouths. That's the crux of this whole piece as the world turns, our words shaping our world. And we see that found in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, the seven days of creation. You don't see God out there with a shovel. He's not out there with a construction crew. There is no scaffolding that is out there. All God does is that he speaks. Didn't matter how bad it looked. Didn't matter how what was not there. Did none, none of that stuff matter. Matter of fact, we find out that the, the presence of God moves towards chaos. Um, we, we, we start Genesis chapter 1 where God moves towards chaos. He, he steps toward, he, he not only steps towards it, he begins to brood over it. He begins to hover over it. And out of this chaos, he speaks. And order comes from chaos. He speaks one word. And then stuff starts separating. He speaks one word and land comes out of water. He speaks one word and divides day from night. He speaks one word. Fish start to swim and birds start clapping or flapping. He speaks one word. The, from the ground, uh, fruit pops up. He, he, he just simply speaks. He speaks. He, he, he's, his, the, the only action that we see in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, I'm starting to get excited, is that is that, is that God is speaking. That's the action word. He speaks and something shows up. And, and we, we learn from that that there's power that is in our mouth. But if I were to poll this house, I bet you it'd be some staggering numbers to show that you've been speaking, no matter what you've been speaking over these past, uh, today makes 16 weeks, that what you've been speaking, no matter how consistent you hadn't seen everything you were believing God for show up. So what's wrong? Is your mouth broken? Is something wrong with your tongue? Do you see what I'm saying? That could create an imbalance in our theology. Unless we not have integrity, biblical integrity. I want to balance that thing out today. And I got some news I got to tell you. But just because you said it once doesn't mean it, it obligates God to do it immediately. Got some bad news for you. Just because you say it twice does not obligate God to do it for you. Oh, I'm just, I just thought of something. When I was a little boy, my parents divorced uh, 12, 13, 11, somewhere there about. And I remember every single night, every single night, I would pray, God, 
put mom and dad back together. God put mom and dad back together. Now, the Bible says that we will not inherit the kingdom unless we come as a little child. I, I, I wasn't but a hair away from being a little child. Um, there's a sense of naivety. What I was praying for, it was biblical, but it didn't happen. God put mom and dad back together. God, God, now 30, 30 some years, 35 years have gone, bare, go, have gone by, and that prayer still has not. Was I not asking in faith? Was I not asking repeatedly? Are you understanding what I'm saying? But what God did, not that He embraces divorce, there is this thing called the will. <laughs> you got to want what God wants. I ain't talking about my mom and my daddy. That's their business is their business. But what I am saying is that sometimes the stuff that you're speaking to has a will that does not want to participate with what you're saying. You got to have balance over this thing. Your will is what separates you from the angels. That's why God won't force you into heaven. Because he wants you to surrender and to give your will. Some stuff, all I'm saying, is about process. Some stuff God needs, needs some time. Some, some, some stuff is not just about you standing and speaking. Some stuff is God put his hands on you. In comes Jeremiah, chapter number 18, verse number 1. Genesis 1 and 2, we see him speaking the word. Y'all, we can't see that. Can you put it in black for me? Jeremiah chapter 18, verse number 1, it says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Y'all know this passage, this story. Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. <laughs> he didn't stop speaking. Oh, God, I just saw something. He said, you won't get on the right frequency until you get to where I'm telling you to go. Lights out. I'm gone. Sometimes you're not going to hear what God is saying until you do what he said do. Y'all just added 38 seconds to the sermon. Watch now. He said, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Saying, get up, go to the potter's house. What, what does the next word say? You might not be able to see it. And there. He ain't going to cause, he's not going to, to, to cause, it means to make him hear it. Anybody ever had your mama grab you and say, boy, do you sit, do you want to say? Your mama would make you hear what she's saying. Come here, step be traumatic God is saying God is saying I'm going to make you hear what I got there is not going to be any mistake on what I'm going to say but I'm not going to say it until you are obedient he was talking in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 He's still talking in Jeremiah chapter 18. Get up, go to the potter's house, that I will cause you to hear my words. Verse 3, then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. Oh, God, I just saw something else. God starts talking based on what Jeremiah starts seeing. Y'all get that? You don't want to lie. I know y'all got it. <laughs> Jeremiah shows up in the potter's house and he sees a potter at the wheel making something. And Jeremiah goes, uh oh, wait a minute. You ever walk in someplace and you start seeing something and ain't nobody talking to you? You, 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 at work, and you see them bunched up over at the water fountain, and suddenly you start hearing something based on what you see. 
Anybody know what I'm talking about? That, that, that's what's going on. Then, then he went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something on the wheel. And the vessel that he made, what the potter was making was made out of clay, marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to make the pot. Oh, that was, I read too fast. Jeremiah gets there, he sees the potter making a vessel, then the Bible says, and it was marred. There's a mistake. The clay is in his hand, but what's in his hand is imperfect. He's, he's doing something, but, but what he's doing, even though the clay represented of us, is in his hand, there's imperfection. The end goal is some pottery. But while he's making the pot, he feels something, says it was marred in his hand, so he had to throw it away and start over. Can I just announce that God doesn't want some of you to end up as messed up pots. I better not flirt with that one because I'll stay, I'll, I'll stay too long. There are some similarities between the God who allows that to be spoken to show up and the God who is in the potter's house working with some clay. First similarity, it's the same God. And that ought to help somebody right there that just because you're not seeing a thing show up in your house doesn't mean that God doesn't like you. That something's wrong, that you don't have enough faith, that, that you ain't one of God's favorite kids. That, no, it doesn't mean any of those kinds of things. It just means that God knows what he's doing. All right, all right here, here we are, here we are. I got three things, I think. Three things, three things I, I want to share with you when it comes to similarities. The unseen is under construction. The unseen is under construction. Hmm. The unseen is under construction. Uh, play, play the clip for me, please. Um, look, look at what happens when, when God shows up um, and he's there. Well, this step is to... Potter's house. Um, that's symbolic of the potter's hands. And, and now we have the clay. We don't know what this thing is going to look like. But the potter knows. Uh, the clay is under construction. Uh, the potter's hands are applying appropriate pressure to shape the vessel that is being made. Uh, in the first scene, the potter was using his hands to shape the vessel. This scene starts off, and he has an instrument in his hands that goes along into the clay and creates another place for his fingers, and now he adds some additional... We don't know what shape the bowl is going to be. Uh-oh. There, there, there it is. It was, it was unseen to start off with. We, we couldn't really tell, but we know it's not going to be a short, a short, small vessel. But, but it looks like he's building it up that he knows, but we don't know. Um, the vessel is all right because the potter's hands are still on it. But the vessel don't even know what the potter is Making him out to be. Speak and become become a cigarette. I, I call you forth to be a cigarette holder. I call you forth uh, to be a cereal bowl. Uh-oh. No, you are a pitcher. Y'all missed it. Do we have to? It doesn't matter what you start calling if the potter ain't making what you saying. The potter knows. Paul says it like this. We look through a glass dimly lit. Paul says, Paul says, I can look through it and I can see something behind it. Uh, uh, it's, it's the picture of some fractured glass. 
Uh, it, it, have you ever shattered a window or seen a shattered window, shattered glass? It, it has all the little, little veins in it. You can't see it. It's, 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 not, it's, not, it's glass, but you can't see it. You can see some stuff moving. Maybe you can see some colors, but you can't read anything. You can't see with any kind of clarity. Paul is telling us in that scripture, when we look through a glass, dimly lit, we can see some stuff. We know that God is working. We know that he's doing something, but we don't know what he's doing. So here I am looking through my glass because I want a man, because I want some more money, because I'm tired of, I'm, I'm, I'm 40 something and I need a wife. I'm tired of sowing my wild oats. And so I'm going to call it into this. I can't call no man into existence. Y'all just got to excuse me. I go call into existence. She, she going to be 5'2. <laughs> Where's size 7 shoe? Long, real hair. <laughs> Fit in the waist, cute in the face. So I'm calling the stripper I saw, I mean the woman that I saw. <laughs> They're my church. They're my church. Y'all ratchet with a little bougie. Yeah, I, I, I got you. I got you. You start calling Goma in. You got to know your Bible to know that one. And God got a Hannah for you. Goma, Goma, she was the prostitute that married the prophet. Hosea, you know, she, y'all know prophecy, and she, she did what she did. She, she retired from the whole stroll, and she married a preacher. Well, she still had a little whole stroll in her. And so she went back to strolling. I shouldn't act like this with company. I'm sorry. Y'all just got to love me or leave me. Hannah, Hannah spent her days praying. <laughs> Hannah, Hannah, she fought on her knees. Penina, you know, was, she, she, she was the other woman. Hannah was the father in the name of Jesus. I, I just, I, don't forget about, don't forget my, Lord, you have closed up my womb. She, she prayed so hard until they got confused and the preacher thought she was drunk. Hannah was a woman of God. So you calling in Goma, but God done sent you a Hannah. He, he, he sent you a praying woman. He sent you a woman with some patience. So you calling in what you see, but it ain't what you need. She done called my whole name. She said, Preach Jasper Williams. The third. <laughs> so... So, uh, God, God, we don't always know what we need. Here in come Paul. So we're looking through a glass dimly lit. So you're saying what the pottery is going to be is going to be a cup. No, it ain't. I call forth in a cigarette tray. No, it ain't. I call forth a plate. No, it ain't. I call, I call forth a little bread plate. No, it ain't. I call forth a cereal bowl. No, it ain't. Because you see something, but you don't know what the potter has on his mind. I wish I had some help. And so what I got to start doing is I got to start, I, got, I can call it as much as I want, but when it shows up, I got to take what I get. Because if, if man knows how to give his child bread, why would God give us a scorpion? I'm still in the Bible. I wonder if more of us have what we've been calling already in our purview. I'm going to mess with y'all now right, right, right along through here. Touch your neighbor and say, here he come, here he come, here he come. 
What if you've been looking at the woman at work that got goma potential? But the lady that sit at the gate where you put your little card in on the outside, that's your Hannah. You passing by what you've been talking to, trying to holler at what you don't need. Do I need to rewind that one? Did y'all did, did y'all did y'all catch that one? Could it be that we so locked and loaded on what we want until we don't see what we need? Boy, that boy preaching. That boy is preaching. You need to go back. God, do I already had a job opportunity? God, God, a, a, am I missing what it's gonna take to get a ring put on it? Am I missing my answer to my wealthy people? Have I walked walk past it? The unseen. That's the point. The unseen, whether it's a Genesis 1 and 2 or whether it's a Jeremiah 18, the unseen is under construction. You're going to have to get up and do it again even when it don't show up. Before 2019 ends, you got to know that 2020, 2020 is coming. I'm still, I'm, she, she yelled out, he coming. He, he's coming. I believe it. I'm in faith with you. He's coming. God has made you to be somebody's help me. You got to understand that God don't, uh, he, he, you, I wonder, I wonder if somebody would get up and call again. The unseen. It's brought, excuse me, it's under construction. <laughs> that pressure that God has put on you. You the, you the clay, he the pot on you. you. You feel him squeezing you in a little bit. It's getting tight. God, how am I, how am I supposed to live off this? He's, he's squeezing you in. God, I, 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 I'm used to living on this, but you, now you got me. He's squeezing you in because he's making you into something. Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. Neither has it entered into the hearts of men. He's, he's, he's making the unseen. Why don't somebody just lift up your hand and say, my unseen is under construction. Say it again. My unseen is under construction. Shh, 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 shh. You hear that? Shh, shh. That's a hammer. Oh, shh, 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 shh. I hear a drill. Shh, shh, shh. That's a jackhammer. I wonder what God is may lift up those hands again and say, my, undeseen, my unseen is under construction. He's still working on me. I'm not what I ought to be. It took him a week to make the sun, moon and stars, earth and wind, Jupiters and Mars. I'm not yet what I ought to be, but he's still, that's the song I used to sing as a little boy, working on me, you, your unseen is under construction. Here's the, here's the next thing, lest I stay too long. The unseen is brought into subjection. The unseen is brought into subjection. Whenever you stood up and God had something twinkling in your heart and you released your faith for it, it took faith to show up. I got a need. I told some of y'all about my need last week. I got a need. I put it before God because he meets needs. And I trust that God's going to raise up what I need because I got a need. So, 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 so it took some faith for me to call it unto. I, I, I got to have some faith to speak to my need and say every dime. 
every, I'm, I'm, matter of fact, I, 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 I want some popcorn money. It, every, it takes faith. It takes faith for you to call what you don't have into subjection the same way it takes faith to trust the process on being on the wheel. Oh, I need to help somebody. I need... I mean, some of y'all been wanting to give up this Christianity thing, this church thing. I'm going to quit saying I'm a Christian. I'm just going start saying I, I believe in a higher power. Girl, you better get back your, go, back, go back and get your sanctification, what your grandmama used to tell you about. No, it's a higher power, but his name is Jesus. You, 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 you have to understand, you have to understand that, that, that the potter, the potter, he brings... This clay. Play the clip again. Play, play the clip again. Watch, watch this now. Watch how the clip starts. Watch how the clip starts. Um, when, 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 we, when we get to the potter's house and we start seeing what the potter is doing, he, he beating on it. He's calling it into, into subjection. The unseen is being brought into subjection. When he first started, it wasn't looking. It was just a, just a big pile. And so he starts putting on this thing, spinning it. And he, he uses his hand. He uses pressure to bring about a certain shape. And he changes where his hand is being, he's calling, he's bringing his thing into subjection. And then, then he goes and gets something hard. That's a stone that's being used. It spins on a stone, but that little tool that he had in his hands, it's another He takes something hard and puts it on something soft. You missed it. He takes something hard and he puts it on something soft. He, he's calling it under subjection. Then he takes the same hard thing, go and dip it some wet and pull some wet from a hard thing back into a soft thing. He's calling it under subjection. What God is working on in your life, he's bringing in a, he, to be called in subjection, he's saying, you ain't going to act like what you think how you used to act. Oh, I don't know why that was for you, ma'am. I, I, I do not know why, that's, why that was for you. But, but it's, 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 you don't have to do what you used to do to get what you've always been wanting. I, I hear God saying, let me do it. <laughs> Pastor, you don't know how many times I messed up. You don't know how many, what it looked like. You don't know this, that, and the other. The Bible said in Jeremiah chapter uh, 18, in verse 4, in verse 3, it says that he felt that the vessel was marred. And so he had to start over again. The only way you can feel a mistake in, in clay is if your hands is on it. That's bad English. Is if your hands are on it. Only way I can feel an imperfection in the bubble is if I'm, God had his hands on you the whole time. While you were in college and doing what you were doing and and pledging and dropping like it was hot and, and pledging grad chapter and, and all this other kind of stuff at the club, at compound and 112 and all that. God had his hands on you and he just kept starting you over. Let me do this again. Let me, let, let me, you were running dope and you had all kind of girls and making babies all across. Let me do this. He got your hands on you. Let me, let me start you over. Okay, now I ain't going to be sleeping around with everybody. I'm just going to watch some porn because you know he got his hands on you. Let me throw you over and start you over and I can't rest now. I can't rest. I done gave up my weed, but this medical marijuana, let me throw you over. And Y'all don't want to be real. Y'all don't. Went through depression in 2014, 15 in October, but I had my hand, got your hand, and he feel a little something, so he gonna do it again. Would you just touch some folk around you and say he got your, his hands on you? His hands. He got your. He got his hands on you. He's. He's got his hands on you.
just don't take your hands off of me. Is this making sense? Just because of what you are saying, just because it doesn't show up, doesn't mean that the same God is not working. Here's, here's my final point. First thing I want you to understand is that the unseen is under construction. Second thing I wanted you to understand is that the unseen is being brought into subjection. Here's the third thing. The process is a part of the blueprint. The process is a part of the blueprint. You, a blueprint, it shows you what's going to be made. Blueprint tells you how, what it's supposed to look like after it's over. See, <clears throat> if we look at God looking at us today, he knew 7,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, that he was going to need some land, some water, a man, a woman, a firmament, some light, some darkness, some beast of the field. Some, he, he knew then that he was going, we were going to need that today. It was a part of the blueprint. So God put in place back then what he knew we need today. So he stands and he speaks. But in Jeremiah chapter 18, it's interesting. I've not heard a lot of sermons emphasize the context of Jeremiah chapter 18. This is where the train might be off a little bit. When, when, you get, when you get home, I wish you'd go back and read prior scriptures and scriptures that come after it. But if we, if we keep reading in verse 11 of Jeremiah 18, it says, Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now everyone from his evil way and make your ways and your doings. Uh-oh. Let me, let, me, let me try to read that again. See? If what I read, I really read it. Now, therefore, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, the Lord says, behold, I'm fashioning, I'm shaping, I'm making a disaster and devising a plan ag against you. Wait a minute, this is the same God that I was just praising. He got his hands on me. When I get to verse 11, I'm like, you can take them off. <laughs> I don't need no more trouble. How about you? <laughs> no, uh-uh. No, I'm straight. <laughs> I 
But have you ever thought that sometimes God has to devise a plan or cause a disaster? Look at what it says. Return now from one from your evil ways and make your ways and your doing. And your, you've been doing wrong so long. Until God says, they ain't going to hear my word. Remember the verse starts out, he tells Jeremiah to go to the potter's house and there I will make you here. They ain't going to go to church. So they can't hear the word there. They going to hang around the wrong folk. They still on Tinder. Swiping right. Ms. Bechet don't know about Tinder. Uh -huh. Rose will tell you later. Shucks, Rose might not know. <laughs> it's a dating app. Well, more like a hookup app. More like a booty call app. <laughs> Rose, I was meaning because you were younger than your mom. Not that you would be able to tell her, but look like I got to tell both of y'all. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> God says, God says, Child, you've been doing wrong too long. Come back. Come back. Watch now. I command you to come back. And you don't even act like the land and the sea. Because you got a will. So you, you speak. God says, come back. I love you. I sent my son to die on the cross for your sins. And you keep on walking. I don't need to hear all that Jesus stuff. I, I said when I got out the house, I wasn't going back to no church. So God, God tried to make your world turn, and he calls you, but you don't want to come because you got a will. And so you keep living this life of the world. God says, the only way I'm going to keep them from killing themselves is if I fashion a disaster and devise a plan. So God says, I love you so much until you probably going to get mad at me when it gets this hard for you. But I'm doing what I'm doing because I love you. See, I can't look for no witnesses in here. But some of y'all have had God just turn your world upside down because you were living like you were full of the devil. You were living like there was no God. You didn't want to know him. You didn't want to live. And so God had to let it all implode. He let your money leave. He let your mate leave. He, he, he let it all just fall out from underneath you because God says, there's nothing I won't do for my son and for my daughter. And since I'm calling him to come back and he won't come back, I'm going to have to fashion him. I feel God in this place. The Bible says, no weapon formed against me shall, you know, the commission was just in town, shall prosper in one way. <laughs> so you go looking at your disaster. You, you're looking at this plan, and you got just enough Jesus that you ain't forgot to remember the old school commission song. And here you go. You scrape up that last bit of anointing. No weapon formed against me 
shall prosper. It won't work. Lord gave me a revelation on this. The weapon that he says won't work is the one that somebody else is making to take you out. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He doesn't say your weapon that you form yourself is not going to be a part of the process of me making you come back to me. Because real talk is, some of the stuff you in now, you did it. It wasn't no hater, it wasn't no abuser, it wasn't no molester, it wasn't no bad boss. But you got bad credit because you swiped it. Fred need to make a new song. I don't know how good it's going to be. 